even as we pray for Israel, I mean, we're, we're a pro-Israel church here, and we recognize the importance of Israel and the, the spiritual significance of Israel through the body, but um, as you pray, let's, let's pray for, uh, I, mean, I don't know if you saw the news, but basically Israel did some crazy warfare stuff where they put some, I don't know how they did this, but the Mossad, they're a, Bad to the bone, folks. I mean, they loaded up thousands of pagers and, and phones and so forth with explosives. And I don't know how you do this, but they increased the temperature of batteries with doing cyber stuff. And basically at once, these Hezbollah uh, terrorists who were carrying around these pagers, I mean, they just started blowing up on them. Boom, 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 and leaving Hundreds of Hezbollah guys, uh, I mean, there are many fatalities, um, but blinded, and so forth. But let's also pray for these terrorists and enemies. As you pray, pray that in their blindness, in their, the ones who weren't killed but came close to death, pray that their eyes see the Messiah. And that just like Paul, who wrote this letter we're digging into, just like Paul went from a very religious zealot, we could probably go to the point of terrorist, was changed and transformed for the glory of God. So let's pray for, for these folks too, just as we go into the days ahead. I know in our humanness sometimes we're like, I ain't praying for him. I ain't, I ain't, I ain't. No, we want these people <laughs> to come to know the Messiah. You ready, sister? You ready? She's like, man. Why didn't you bring me up now? You brought me up five minutes ago. <laughs> so it's basically just this. It'll be our passage for today. Philippians 2, 1 through 13. All right. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, Maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who as, <clears throat> who as he already exited in the form of God, existed... In the form of God. He did exit too, but he existed in the form of God. Did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptying himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. For this reason, also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of of Jesus, every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Christ Jesus is Lord, to the glory of the God, to the glory of God the Father. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to desire and to work for His good pleasure. Hallelujah and amen and amen. Thank you for reading. So that's the passage we're digging into this evening. And I um, so wanted to get that out there. Go ahead and read our passage that we're going to be covering. And now I'm going to go back. And we're actually going to back up a few verses from even what was just read as we dive in and start digging beneath the surface here. So I'm, I'm going to go back into Philippians 1, where we were last week. Not going to read our whole passage from last week. I'm just going to go back to verse 27. Read those few verses and then go into chapter 2, verse 1. Because remember when Paul wrote this, there were no chapter breaks. That's a man-made thing, not that it's a bad thing. It helps us in location and teaching and uh, so forth, but that was a man-made thing. Paul just kept writing, 
straight from chapter 1, chapter 2. So here we go. Philippians 1, verse 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And in no way alarmed by your opponents. Nope, nope, not intimidated, not going to be scared of them. No way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and this too from God. For to you, it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer on his behalf experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. That ends chapter 1. Paul would have gone right into chapter 2. Therefore. So it's a, it's a privilege. We've been granted this awesome privilege to believe in, in the Lord but also to suffer for him. Therefore, which I'm sure y'all, y'all know this well, that you'll come across many therefores throughout the Bible as we read and study Scripture, and it's just good Bible study uh, discipline, just a good study technique to practice, to, to, to know and understand that when you come across the therefores, we need to know what they're there for. So therefore is a, it's a transition word. It's a connection word. So we've just come through chapter 1. When Paul's harping on this, we got to be living in a manner worthy of the gospel. He, Paul's emphasizing this theme of unity. He's emphasizing to stand firm and strive together in one spirit with one mind and to be fearless in your walk because it's a privilege to suffer for Christ. Therefore, therefore, so let's keep rolling. Read the first the whole first couple verses now. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation or comfort of love, agape, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, Maintain in the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. In reading this, I can just hear, I hope you can by way of the Holy Spirit, just hear Paul pouring his heart out in these opening words of chapter 2. He's saying if you've been encouraged in some kind of way by Christ, if you've been on the receiving end of his incredible, comforting, agape love, if you've been in any way in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, and last but not least, if you're truly born again and you're housing the Spirit of the living God and you have any affection and compassion whatsoever for the people of God. And this word here for this affection and compassion is... Splang known, something like that. We've talked about this a couple weeks ago. But it's this word of like gut level compassion. I mean, it's all down in the depths of your being. It's that deep seated, strong feelings deep down within. So, so if this is you, if you can put yourself in that category, not perfect, but that's what we're striving towards, then Paul's saying, make my joy complete. By being of the same mind, having the mind of Christ, maintaining the same agape, that God love, united in spirit, unity in the Holy Spirit, and intent, focused, dialed in, locked in on moving forward together with one purpose and one goal, 
And this is to be the reality of the church, the people of God. And just to belabor this theme of unity a little more, because this is like the top tier, one of the top tier themes in this letter is true unity can only come from the spirit of the living God. He is the glue of unity. True unity is spiritual and comes from deep within when you're filled with the Spirit. Unlike uniformity, which is something forced upon or pressured or convinced to do from the outside, like if you're... um, I don't know, you have a certain job and you got to wear a certain uniform. That's uniformity. You're going to look the same. It's coming from an outside force where the people of God contain. We house. We are supposed to be full of his spirit. And it's that spirit that brings true unity amongst God's people. We're to be a people of one mind, one love, one spirit. One purpose. And the only force which brings that about is the Holy Spirit. And I believe not just to demean or condemn or drag through the mud, but that's, I believe that's the very reason of how the enemy has been able to get a foothold in the big C overall church these days is because if you're truly under the authority and lordship of the Holy Spirit and he's the one dominating your soul and leading you, it's it's not hard for unity to exist. I've seen it, I've experienced it, but I've I've also been a part of the other side when I'm not (laughs) under, and it can happen quick. Let your soul get outside the the influence of the Holy Spirit. Man, you turn critical and hateful and nasty towards the people of God. I'm guilty of it. But man, having experienced the other side, the beautiful side, God, I don't ever want to be guilty of, of that again. Paul, he says these basically these same words. In his other letters that he wrote to other congregations as well, to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1, he says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Unity. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, Be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Then to the the congregation in Ephesus, he wrote in Ephesians 4, he said, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always, 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 Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Whoo, this is one. Make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Man. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit. Man, this right here. We might have a different translation from what's on the screen, what I'm reading. Oh, means the same, but I want to read that again. Be patient with each other. And y'all, this is something we are going to have to command our souls to do. We can read it. It sounds really nice, sounds really spiritual. We want our lives to be this way. But then when it's time for the rubber to meet the road and, we, and to do it, That's where I fall short many times and where I see others fall short many times who call themselves after the name of Jesus. 
So in Jesus' name, (laughs) by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, help us, for your glory, help us to be patient with each other and to make allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Help us to not reach down each other's throats when others commit faults. And they're weak. No, help us to make allowance. Give some leeway for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit. Binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and in all and living through all. That's Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, if you want to. Jot it down. And I just want to ask, in in reading these opening verses to Philippians chapter 2, and then reading these other words of Paul to the church in Corinth and Ephesus, and all this unity, and that there be no division in the church, I want you all to operate in one mind, with one spirit, united for one purpose. When we think of the modern day church, Is that the reality? Is that the reality? It's supposed to be the reality. And I do see it just in my little sphere and realm and all. I do see it in small pockets. I see this happening. But I don't believe this is the heartbeat of the church at large. And I just praise God that he's long-suffering with us. So going into verse 3, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. If I can be real with y'all, I struggle with this every day. Most likely, if we took a poll and everybody was honest, we'd probably all say we struggle with this every day. Because when our eyes open in the morning, even before we get our feet up out the bed, our default mode, where we go, maybe y'all are more spiritual than me, I don't know, but... It's just right off the bat. I have got to get it under lock quick and, and <laughs> quick and in a hurry for the Holy Spirit to start dominating my soul and calling the shots because it's just selfish right away. It's just pride right away. It's me, 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 myself, and I right away. And then it's the struggle all through the day. But I praise the Lord that I'm, I'm growing and maturing and hearing, hearing his voice and growing in his spirit more and more. Because there's times, I mean, it's all through the day and especially, God, I'm in this role of ministry and it's all about other people and all that. And get calls or, <clears throat> I'm just being real. So if, if y'all come to the office, you call me on the phone or whatever, it's not every time, I won't say that, but... But there are times where it's like I'll get, and I'll just stare at my phone sometimes. And I'll just let it ring sometimes. Like, do I really? And then the Holy Spirit comes in and he starts pounding my heart with them holy thumps. And he's like, boy, (laughs) you better. You better. But then usually what happens, I mean, I hope I'm a blessing and encouragement and rise to the occasion in Jesus' name and and bless the person on the other side of the line. But I tell you, more times than not, when those times happen and I'm sitting there selfishly and I'm like, God, I don't want to answer this. When I do call or when I do meet with the person, I ain't kidding, usually I get rocked and blessed 
way more than probably what the other person got. It's so humbling. Ministry is so humbling. Whether you do it as your, I hate to call it a job. I mean, it's what I do. Whether you do it like that or, y'all know what I'm talking about. It's super humbling walking with the Lord. But I'm grateful for it. So we're to do nothing from selfishness, or empty conceit. Do nothing from rivalry, competition, carnality, selfish ambition. Don't do anything from vain glory with, with empty pride or for vanity's sake. But with humility, with humility, with humility, consider others more important than yourself. This word humility packs a powerful punch because at least what I've seen and come to understand and what I've experienced is that humility, it, it truly comes when you honestly examine yourself or compare yourself up against the Lord. You can still be humbled and like looking at other people's faith. But I'm truly humbled when I am just rocked by the glory of the Lord and how he's just way too good to us. Because it's those moments when you, when you put yourself up against the Lord and you put yourself up against the humility of Jesus. <laughs> you just left wrecked and undone. Because the reality is you can if you want to manipulate the situation, you can, you can put yourself up against another human being and you can manipulate and twist and find a way to compare yourself to another and it just give your soul a little pride boost. Kind of, oh, well, get that little ego boost. But no matter who you are, every human being born here on planet Earth no matter who you are, and man, woman, child, we stand on level ground when we compare ourselves and put ourselves up against the glory of the Lord himself. There is zero pride when you compare yourself to King Jesus. You're only left humbled to the core, but in the most amazing way. When you do this, you feel really small, but in the most comforting way. And eyes quickly get off yourself and onto others when you compare yourself to Jesus. Andrew Murray, he, uh, he shared something that was, that was very true, but has a comical side to it as well. And he says, humility is that grace that when you know you have it, you've lost it. When you get to that point where you're like, well, you know what? I am a little humble these days. You're the most prideful person in the room at that moment. <laughs> because when you're, and I'm sure y'all know this and have experienced this and probably walking in this right now, when you're truly seeking the Lord, you never reach humility in your own eyes. You may be the most humble person in somebody else's eyes, but you still look at yourself as just an old scumbag. <laughs> like, God, I ain't even close to humility. But somebody else may see you as the most humble person. Because the closer you draw near to God, you see just how far away you are and how, how much you fall short of his glory. But also when you're truly seeking the Lord and you want to be a humble man, a humble woman. And the fruit and the ministry of the Holy Spirit is active and working in your life. You don't see it. But when that's the reality of your life, other people see that humility. And it's one of the most beautiful, attractive traits in someone's life. And, and scripture also says that the blessing of the Lord is with the humble. Isaiah 66 says, this is the Lord Almighty speaking. He says, I will bless those 
who have humble and contrite hearts, who tremble at my word. I want to be that kind of guy, and I think y'all do as well. Moving on into verse 5, it says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. If we compare this to another letter of Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, Paul just straight up says, he says, We have the mind of Christ. It's hard for me to dwell on that too long because I love that statement. I believe that statement. I want to walk in that truth. But man, we have the mind of Christ. That's super humbling. So when we compare this Philippians 2 to this 1 Corinthians, this have this attitude in yourselves is, is basically the same where that attitude and mind can go hand in hand. So the attitude of Christ Jesus, the mind of Christ Jesus is to be what we operate in. So now let's read a little bit more to this from verse 5 on. It says, have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus Every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This whole section here, it's a very famous, uh, well-known section of scripture. Probably one of the most powerful descriptions of the Son of Man, Yeshua, Jesus, which has ever been written. Some even say that this was a very early on an ancient um, poem or a messianic hymn written by possibly Paul or someone else. You don't see it so much in this translation we just read, but you can look at other translations, and some translations will have it written out in a very poetic, rhythmic way. It's, uh, I mean, I think y'all know this. When you translate from the original languages to English, I'm grateful for it because it's all I know. But things don't line up and words don't translate most perfectly. And also, we don't see this so much in the English, but just a neat little, neat little detail. This is probably an a early worship song, a messianic hymn. In that day. Yeah. Absolutely. Come on. You want the mic? Yeah. It's the CJB, right? Complete Jewish? Yeah. Yeah. Where do you want me to start? I mean, you can just read the whole thing if you want Start yeah there. that'd be fine yeah okay. it's worthy to read again that's for sure just because pastor joe um last year directed me to the cjb which is the messianic jewish bible so that's what i study from now so i used to study the american version i studied king james i studied through new king james but Um, somebody in my past told me to study the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm sorry, I'm giving you my back. (laughs) Study the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so I study the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I also study through this and a concordance. 
So it's interesting, like Pastor Joe said, um, when you go back to the Hebrew, the Greek, and the Aramaic, it's different. And the tone is completely, not completely, but it's different from our American version. Um, it's more flavorful, you know, like a good Mexican dish. <laughs> so here it is. I'm um, in verse 6. Or let me go back to verse 5. That way yeah. you all Either can way. follow. It says, let your attitude toward one another be governed by your being in union with Messiah Yeshua. Number six, though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God something to be possessed by force. On the contrary, he emptied himself in that he took the form of a slave by becoming like human beings are. And when he appeared as a human being, he humbled himself still more by becoming obedient even to death, death on a stake as a criminal. Therefore, God raised him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name, that in honor of the name given Yeshua, every knee will bow, and in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will acknowledge that Yeshua the Messiah is Adonai, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Thank you, Miss Sonia. And if you, I know everybody don't have a copy, but in that translation, they actually put it in the poetic, rhythmic, rhythmic way there. Um, so let's break this down a little bit. Because that is a powerhouse passage. So there in verse 5 and 6. Having this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. I'm sure we know this, no new news. But the existence of Jesus, the Son of God, did not begin at conception in his mother Mary's womb. His existence did not begin when he was birthed in Bethlehem a couple thousand years ago. Because Jesus, the Son of God, is eternal. And Paul tells us here, in those verses, he said, as he already existed in the form of God. So he's been there since the beginning in Colossians 1. I love cross especially since this is a, a letter of Paul. When you start cross-referencing everything he's saying to the different congregations in the different areas, um, it so much builds on each other, and it, it, it's, a, it's a fun journey to do that. So Colossians 1, he says, he says, he, that's Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So Jesus, I think we know this, is God. And according to our verses, although fully God, he chose for that brief, roughly 33-year time in the course of history not to consider himself equal with God. Talk about some humility. And this is stuff that if we've been in the church for any length of time or you've read this over and over or you've heard many messages about this, it's, it can almost become just the rote Sunday school answer. Oh, yeah, he's Jesus. He's the son of God. I mean, he didn't consider himself equal. Whew. When you get outside the, that religious head knowledge, blah, 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 just spitting off facts about Jesus that hold no meaning, when you can get, break out of that, and actually meditate on this, of what, what's actually happening there, that's humil humility on a whole nother level. That's levels of humility no other king 
would ever even begin to think about, give any attention to, or, or even desire. I mean, we, let's just take real, some, we wouldn't even choose, at least, well, I've heard of a couple, but we wouldn't even choose most times to take a, a job demotion or to take a pay cut in a job or a career to lower ourselves a little bit, let alone being the creator himself. Dwelling in heaven, living in absolute perfection and glory. And say, you know what, I'm going to leave this behind and go live on a little dirt ball called earth because I, I really love my creation there. Then you go into verse 7. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. I hope that word bondservant, if you've been with us through the last few weeks, I hope that word bondservant, maybe a bell's going off in your mind. Anybody recall where that word bondservant was used earlier in our Philippians study? Anybody remember? Yeah. Paul referred to himself as that. So he said, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus. If you remember, that word is doulos, basically meaning someone who belongs to another without any ownership rights of their own. So again, if we can break out of rote religious Sunday school mentality, break out of that, Jesus emptied himself, taking on that. Basically the lowest of the low, like a slave, a, a slave of slaves, like, and then being born in the likeness of men. Just uh, Isaiah 53, um, I mean, very famous, famous prophetic passage, all about the Messiah. But verse 2 says this it says, My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot. This is messianic prophecy, like a root in dry ground. So interesting. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance. Nothing to attract us to him. So like all the... Not trying to be disrespectful, just trying to be real, but like all the GQ sexy model Jesuses out on Google. Not real. Scripture says there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. That's the real Jesus. Just a regular blue-collar guy. Of course, he wasn't just a regular guy. He's the son of God. He's the Messiah. But he chose to empty himself, counting himself no longer equal on that God status with his father. He became a slave, born as lowly as a man could possibly be born here on earth. That's a savior. That's my king. Verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. So walking around as a regular guy, looking no different than the other men walking this earth, he continued to go lower and lower and lower, humbling himself more and more and more to the point of death. Because this was his mission in coming to earth. 
and he saw it through to completion. Beaten beyond recognition as a man, treated worse than animals, suffering the most inhumane treatment until he breathed his final breath upon that Roman crossbar, enduring the most horrific death one could go through. But an important detail to notice and take away is that he was obedient to the point of death. Death was his mission in coming to earth, and he was obedient to the end. Man did not take his life. Remember, he had all the mighty warrior angels at his disposal. He just had to give a sign, say a word, and he'd have been rescued. But he came to earth voluntarily, obeying and fulfilling his prophetic mission to save mankind from his sin, which would ultimately lead to eternal damnation. To drive this home a bit more, John 10 says, No one, this is Jesus speaking, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. John 15, a famous one. Greater love is no one than this. And someone laid down his life for his friends. Let's go on into verse 9. For this reason, so everything we just talked about, for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I can't stress this enough, but he lived a life of utmost humility and obedience, obedient even unto death, satisfying and pleasing the Father's wrath against mankind Jesus the son of God gave up everything gave up his status his dignity his very life for us the fathers raised him up and exalted him above all given him the name above all names and by the promise and authority of scripture Every knee will bow to him. Every tongue will confess. Believers and unbelievers alike. Those who love him and those who hate him. Everyone will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So with that said, let's just think about this. Because I love this. I'd say we love this. We love to sing songs and declare that, throw a fist in the air, Jesus is Lord of Lords, and he's King of Kings. But a great reality, and a great spiritual reality here is Paul is given a big time spiritual throat punch to the Roman emperor, and really the Roman empire as a whole. Because he's saying, I don't care, Mr. Emperor, how mighty and how high and enthroned and great and majestic you are or think you are. You're not the Lord. You're not God. Yeshua, Jesus, is Lord. And even for you, old buddy, one day, you will humble yourself before him. You will bow the knee, and you are going to confess the ultimate truth. In Isaiah 45, I'll say this, Paul would have been been an expert and, and a biblical genius 
when it came to the Tanakh or the Old Testament. Probably to the point that he had most of it memorized. And some of these words that he used here in this passage in Philippians 2, he probably would have been thinking about Isaiah 45, which says, I have sworn by my own name, I have spoken the truth, and I will never go back on my word. Every knee will bend to me, and every tongue will declare allegiance to me. In another letter, again, once again, to the, to the congregation in Ephesus, in Ephesians 1, Paul says, Now he, Jesus, is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. And then we go into our last couple verses for the evening as we start bringing this thing in. Verse 12, so then... My beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. The encouragement of Paul only continues here. He's patiently waiting. If you remember, he's still locked up in a Roman prison. He's patiently waiting for his deliverance. The saints are praying. He's trusting in the provision of the Holy Spirit to be delivered and break out of this prison one of these days to come stand alongside the Philippians and keep discipling and helping them grow and mature in the faith. So, so with that, calling that to remembrance again. He's telling the Philippians, he's like, my beloved, my dear people, just as you've always obeyed, like you've listened to me, I love you, you love me, I can't be there with you right now. So not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, keep working out your salvation with fear and trembling. When nobody's watching, when I'm not there and I'm not watching, when nobody else is watching, lean in even harder during that time because the true eyes and the eyes that really matter are always watching. The eyes of the Lord miss nothing. So keep working it out. Work it out. Press on. Keep going. Work out your salvation. Second Chronicles 16, it says, For the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth so that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. That's just a good verse to take with us tonight. For the eyes of the Lord are constantly roaming throughout the earth. So that, man, I want this, so that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Just another interesting scripture if you want to jot it down. Because of Paul's scriptural biblical genius, he probably would have had Psalm 2 in mind here regarding working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Psalm 2.11 says, Serve the Lord with reverent fear and rejoice with trembling. So there's this, there's this part. It's not to earn salvation, but it's because we have been saved 
and in our love for the Lord, that's, that's when the working it out comes. We're not working for our salvation, but because we have been saved and born again, now in our love for the Lord, we're working it out with the greatest reverence and respect. But then there's almost a flip-flop here at the end. In verse 13 it says, For it's God who's at work in you, both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. So we're working, now all of a sudden God's working it out. We're working, all of a sudden God's working it out. So we got what seems like a, a paradox going on. But throughout all scripture, <laughs> this paradox is at work. And it's beautiful because there's God's part and there's man's part. And man has done his best to put this reality of, of God's part and man's part. God's foreknowledge and all-knowing power and, um, and man's free will. Man has tried his absolute best to put these into cute little theological boxes that we can put in nice theological books that explain God and his kingdom and his will. But what happens is you can read this theology book and it says this. Then you read this theology book and it says something different. Then you read this theology book and they got a name for something else trying to explain all this. So then what starts happening? We start getting away from what we're commanded to do, which is to be a people who have no divisions among us. A people who are of one mind, operating in one spirit for one goal and purpose. And then the enemy gets in there and gets a little foothold and he's like, I'm going to distract them deceive them and then ultimately I'm going to try and destroy them by having these different boxes and they all think they're right so then I'm going to have them bam 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 and I'm going to break them up into little groups and then I'm just going to have them not really like each other so then instead of advancing the kingdom and moving forward together in one mind with one goal one spirit operating united because we are unstoppable when we're united no we got all these PhDs and this and that who everybody thinks they're right when reality is if everybody will be absolutely humble and honest nobody has 100% accurate and pure and perfect theology but if we'll humble ourselves to the point that where we can work together and like the scripture earlier said we look past one another's faults or maybe what we view as someone's faults and we're willing to lay all that junk down, there's a greater mission. There's a greater cause. There's kingdom work to be done and we need to be united as brothers and sisters marching forward for that goal. You talk about the enemy shaking in his boots. That's the kind of people I want to be a part of I think there's a place for healthy debate, opinion sharing, argument if you want to go there. But may it never even get close to dividing the body of Messiah. I'll read this verse and we'll be done. Ephesians 2. More very famous, popular verses. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us a new in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago 
I think Paul, if we want to have a box, Paul put it all in a pretty good theological box right there. God had, has had this amazing, beautiful salvation kingdom plan since before the foundations of the earth. And he has been so faithful walking alongside all of us knuckleheads and all the knuckleheads that have come before us to see his plan get to here. And he's made us new creations. And now by his grace, we have the greatest privilege to now operate in his name, in his power, for his glory, to go do the good things that he's planned for us since long ago. Amen. Amen.